Good morning, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to the Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Chehalis, um, those both online and in person here. If you are a new returning guest, uh, please fill out the Let's Get Acquainted cards in your pew in front of you. Uh, it helps us know how we are able to serve you. Uh, next, we want to welcome up our guest speaker, Pastor Rudy Caldera, and his wife, um, Anna Silva. Pastor Enrique will introduce them. I thought, hell yeah, I have enough time. <laughs> Let me catch my breath very quick. Hey, uh, I'm very happy to, to have Pastor Rudy and Anna with us here today. They have been helping us with the Youth and the Young Adults Weekend of Worship. Truly, it's been a blessing, and it's been a delicious blessing because of the meals, too. So <laughs> we are going to um, just wanted to, to introduce them to you. Um, Pastor Rudy, did you mention the... Oh, he is working for mm -hmm, the Lake Region Conference in Michigan, and they are pastoring three churches right now, and uh, truly excited. We go all the way back to Nicaragua. Uh, I'm very excited to what he has to share here today, so we just wanted to welcome you. And just a reminder to our youth and young adults, we've been texting too, but we have a potluck today. Uh, there's a delicious meal there for you and after that we're gonna do the blessing bags and we're gonna have our fourth service around two but uh, stay for the food uh, again for this is not not inviting you but it's for the youth and young adults <laughs> and then and then uh, for our visitors too we don't want our visitors to not stay as well so we have the blessing bags and the worship after I'm not sure if you wanted to say something. But amen. Thank you for your time. Um, please take notice of the bulletin inserts in your bulletin, as well as the at a glance section. Um, Lewis County Adventist School has several events, including one happening tonight, the Family Fun Night. It is happening at 6.30, and everybody is invited. Um, now I would like to invite Dan Patton to come up. Happy Sabbath. In your bulletin, it's not as a handout, but uh, looking at Monday night at six o'clock, it says that there is a town hall meeting at Lewis County Adventist School. Since I got here 10 years ago, we've always asked when we're going to 11th and 12th grade, and we are getting very, very close. This is the last step that we need to do. And so this is not the church constituency meeting. This is a meeting that we're inviting all church members and all families that even aren't in our church that send their kids to our school to come and talk about what this looks like to them, what they would like to see. So you're all invited. And then the, uh, we expect as we do a constituency meeting before the end of the school year uh, that we can present hopefully a, a vote to extend to 11th and 12th grade. Thank you so much. Um, now I would like to invite Pam up. Good morning. My message is for all the ladies of the church. In your bulletin, there's this lovely little flyer, and I would like to introduce you to our guest speaker who happens to be here with us today. Our guest speaker is Miss Brenda, if you would stand for just a moment. So we're very excited. She's coming to speak with us at this retreat. We're really encouraging you come away and rest a while you know we're all busy women and it's important to get away and miss brenda has a beautiful music ministry as well so check her out on youtube but i also um if you need a sponsorship please come and talk to me because we want you to go if you would like to go we want to help you make a way thank you Please stand for our call to worship and remain standing for our opening hymn. The text I will be reading today is from Matthew 5, 14 to 16, 
You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So let us glorify him today as we worship him. Our hymn number is number 56, To, to God Be the Glory. It's technically 341. We just had a mix up a little bit, but it's the same, same song. <laughs> Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath morning, for bringing us here together. We ask that you please be here throughout our service, touch our minds and our hearts, and please be with our speaker, Rudy Caldera. We thank you so much, and we praise you in your name. Amen.
Uh, our offering today is for Adventist World Radio, and I would like to read something from Adventist World Radio. Imagine learning about God through a message in a bottle. This is exactly what happened to a man in the Middle East who discovered a unique advertisement for Adventist World Radio. For the online Bible study series, not only that, but after he and his family started watching, his daughters was shocked to find that she had dreamt some of the very things that she was hearing in these programs. The entire family was baptized after watching these videos. From 1,500 churches across the 38 European countries that have already participated in Christ for Europe, to people making decisions for baptism in Pakistan, the Philippines, Ukraine, and more. Thank you for giving to Adventist, Adventist World Radio. And for those who would like to prefer to uh, donate online, there's a little QR code that you can scan and sign your bulletin. Um, it's on a paper that looks like this. There's also a website that you can go to, adventistgiving.org. Um, the children may go back and get their baskets now. The children's offering is for the school mortgage today. And after the children collect the offering, the deacons will go and collect the tithes and offerings. Thank you. to where the church is going to be built. The, the ground near the church had a slope to it and it was actually washing mud down the hill and across the concrete slab where we wanted to work. It was raining hard, really hard. We went to uh, where we were staying. Yeah, we went to where we were staying and it kept on raining. We were right near the Zambezi River. We went up on the hill where we could, where we were um, going to eat, and we could see off into Zambia, and we could see where the rain was falling, and it just kept raining. So we went to church that Sabbath, and like in many places, the young people were sitting all the way in the back, kind of outside of the church and then it started to rain and they came in closer but then the wind was blowing the rain in the side and so people were moving over so that they wouldn't get wet because there were no walls and it rained hard and the pastor was up front and he was trying to speak and he had to yell really loud because the rain was so noisy on the roof 
Oh, it rained hard. It didn't just drip off the edge. It ran off of the edge. So what do you do when it's raining hard and you need to go out and work? What do you do? You stay safe where you are and you don't go? Yeah, it was raining hard. Do you pray about it? Yeah, and ask God to stop the rain so that you can do what you came to do. So we prayed, and we prayed, and we prayed some more. And so the next day was Sunday morning, and guess what? It was still raining. Yeah, we prayed about it, and it was still raining. And we couldn't get much done. We had to, to lay some scaffolding planks out on the mud so we had a place to walk, and, and it was awful. So what did we do then? We prayed some more, right? Remember when Elijah prayed for rain? How many times did he pray? A lot. A lot, yeah. I think it was seven times he prayed. And so we prayed some more. So the next morning, we were still praying, and guess what? The sun came out. Yeah, it quit raining. And the sun came out, and it was getting warm, but the mud was still there. It was kind of a mess, but we got a lot done that day. And so we were thanking God for that. And up on the hill where we ate, where we could see way, like all the way into town, we could see the rain falling out there. You know how when you look a long ways, you can see the rain? But it didn't come to us. It was raining far around. And at night, you think it rained at night? No. No, it didn't. At night, the stars came out, and they were so bright but we could see lightning flashing over this way and flashing over that way. But where we were, it was like God had put a bubble over us so that there was no rain and we got a lot done. And, and by Friday, we had the church all built. And then on Sabbath, we had church together there and there was no rain pounding on the roof so the pastor didn't have to shout real loud. And the music was good. Oh, we had a beautiful Sabbath. We had, they brought some food and we brought some food. And we had, we went outside with our chairs and we could sit under the trees and eat. It was just really nice. So that night, guess what happened? It was the last night we were going to be there. And then we were leaving and it rained. And it rained hard. And again, as we were leaving, the water was running across the road. But God had preserved that time and that place and kept the rain away so we could get work done. So remember when, when life is kind of stormy that we need to pray and then God will take care of us even in the midst of the storm. Can you guys pray for us? We're going to leave in just another week to go to Peru. Can you remember to pray for us that it doesn't rain too much? Okay, you, you remember, Yana? Yeah, when you pray, we're going to fly on the airplane and those haven't really been so good lately either. Yeah, we're going to go build a church in Peru. And so I'd like you to remember to pray for us as we go, that we won't get sick, that the high altitude won't bother us, that we will be able to accomplish the mission. Let's have a little prayer. Father, we thank you that, that you look after us and take care of us and that we need to persevere in prayer. Ask that you be near to each one of these kids today May your spirit be with them, and may they hear your voice speaking to their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.
gracias a la labor que está ya más que están dirigiendo. I first, before we get started with our music service, I just wanted to again thank Mario and the orchestra for always putting together beautiful music. And every time um, I sing with the orchestra, I always think of Pastor Glenn. So, our first song this morning is It Is Well With My Soul. Thank you guys for singing. Our next song this morning is When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. They shall look on him whom they pierce, John 1937. Please sing out. This is a beautiful song, but I'm still learning it myself.
Thank you, guys. Our next song this morning is There is a Redeemer. And Pastor Glenn had asked us to sing it with all we, we, all we have, um, to give it our best. And so to think of him and to think of God while we sing this beautiful song. So there is a Redeemer. I'm going to invite you to kneel with me as we pray, if you're able to. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for bringing us all here today so that we may be blessed uh, by Pastor Rudy's message. Please open our hearts and our ears so that we can hear your voice through him today and rejoice in your name. In your name, amen. Happy Sabbath. Um, we are going to be singing a hymn or song titled Salt and Light for the honor and glory of God.
Happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Oh, I'm excited to be here. I'm so happy. Um, thank you so much for having us. I want to thank Pastor Parra for having us and Pastor Enrique. As he mentioned, we go way back um, from an early age. You know, we knew that we want to be pastors. We knew that we were going to be pastors. And it's amazing that um, now I get to visit his church um, and preach uh, alongside with him. What a blessing it has been. Uh, we've been spending some time with the youth, and now uh, we're spending time with you guys. <laughs> so it's a blessing. It's a blessing to be all together worshiping God. Um, let's bow our heads and pray uh, for God to lead us in the message we have uh, for this morning. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to hear your word once again. I would like to offer my, myself, my life to you, Lord, for you to use me as your instrument. Uh, I don't want to speak, Lord. I want you to speak to us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 14 through 16. That's our key verse. We've been studying this section of the um, Sermon on the Mountain by Jesus. And we're going to be concentrating ourselves with these verses this morning, verse 14 through 16. And can I hear an amen when you have it? Amen? Okay, I'm going to give you a little time. <laughs> Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Amen. All right. Okay, perfect. And it says, you are what? The light 
of what? The world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives what? Light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. During the last few days, we have embarked on a journey uh, to reclaim, to re-identify ourselves with Jesus Christ. We found our identity uh, in Jesus Christ. And it has been a journey of healing, a, a journey of challenge, a journey of transformation. And for those who are joining us this morning, welcome. We're happy to have you uh, in this journey back into our originality with Jesus Christ. We have found that when it comes to answering that fundamental question of who am I, there's no better answer. There's no true answer unless we are in Jesus Christ. He gives us the true answer into our identity. Jesus does not ask us who we are. He tells us who we are. For many identity, it's a long journey of discovery of the unknown, which takes a lifetime to realize Others view identity as a flow. It's directed by our passions and our desires. And always evolving of ourself. That's what some claim. But in Christ, identity, it's a revealed fact. In Christ, identity is a revealed fact. And so we find ourselves with this verse and Jesus in this section before he said, you are the salt of the earth. And now he's telling us, you are the light of the world. And we find ourselves with this theological conundrum, this problem. Because in this particular section of the Sermon on the Mountain, Jesus uses the same word that we find in John. John chapter 1 verse 4 where it reads, in him was life and the life was the light of men. Jesus had claimed before, I am the light. So many scholars conclude that we share the same nature of God. Just because this verse uses the same Greek word, false or light. I'm opposed to this conclusion. Um, but what did Jesus meant when he said, you are the light of the world? If we look a little bit further in John chapter 8, verse 12, it says, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. He who follows me. He who follows me. So, what is success? If I were to ask each one of you, what is success? How can you define success? Um, we can go on, right? We have, everybody will have a different answer. But I think uh, in my experience asking this question to many people around the world, it usually comes up in according to this world, actually, and they're not wrong. This is the general consensus um, when it comes to defining what is success. It's going to be related to t- three key words. Number one, money. People relate success with money or wealth. Uh, Something else, power. When we talk about power, someone who has influence, that's a successful man, some people say. Others relate success with fame. Oh, he's very famous. That's a successful man. That's why we should strive to be a successful, a famous, powerful, uh, a wealthy man. That's what many believe it's success. But what is the Christian worldview of success? How do we define as Christians success? What does it mean to be a woman of success? What does it mean to be a man, a Christian man, and a Christian woman of success? I was just six years old, and I remember that like it was yesterday. My father called for a family meeting. Um, and so we all gathered. I was the youngest, just six years old. My older brothers were about 10 and 12. And so we gathered, we made a little circle, and then 
I remember what, I don't remember what he said, but then he asked us, should we go or should we stay? And he first started with my oldest, uh, first with my mom, should we go or should we stay? And she said, well, I don't know. Well, if you think we should go, then we should go. Then he asked my oldest brother, David, what do you think, David? Um, should we go or should we stay? I don't know, Dad. I really like it here. Um, but if you think that we should go, we should go. And then my middle brother, Emilio, my dad asked him, Emilio, should we go or should we stay? Dad, I want to stay. I really, really like it here. Can we stay, please? And then it was my turn. I looked at my mom and I, you know, I just followed whatever my mom did and my older brother did. And so I said, Dad, we should go. <laughs> I didn't realize back then what we were deciding. You see, my dad was a very educated man. And when he was in um, his young uh, youth, uh, he decided to be a doctor. And so he had the opportunity, given a scholarship to go to Russia, back when it was the Soviet Union. And so he was given a scholarship there. He studied medicine, couldn't graduate there, went back to Nicaragua, graduated from med school in Nicaragua. And later on, he was given again the scholarship to do his specialty in surgery. And we were all there in Russia for a couple of years for him to finish his specialty in surgery. And later on, he was given the opportunity to do a second specialty of gastroenterology. Uh, he went to Argentina, did that. And later on in life, he was given again the opportunity, a scholarship, uh, to study a dual degree of master's in administration and commu international community development in Andrews. Very educated. And like I said before, I didn't understand what was happening there but we were deciding if we were going to stay in the U.S. where my dad would practice or we were going to go back to our home country, Nicaragua, where God was calling him to establish a sanatorium, a clinic, a community service for people to just receive attention according to our philosophy of health. And so the decision was made. We went back to Nicaragua. We didn't stay in the U.S. Time went by, and I regretted many times saying we should go. You see, there were times in my home where we didn't, we didn't have something to eat. There was no wealth. Sometimes I had to use the same shoes, and they were already ripped to go to school. And sometimes my dad would leave for a couple of weeks because he was on a missionary trip. I didn't understand what that was. And I regretted that answer, and I said, I wish I would have stayed in the U.S. And we wish I would have said that we should have stayed, because I knew that if we would have stayed, we would have been uh, very wealthy. Years went by, and I was able to actually accompany my father into one of these mission trips. Um, he dedicated a lot of his time going to the indigenous uh, section of our country in the Atlantic zone where there are Mesquito indigenous people living. And he would go there, there was a clinic, there was a school, and there was a church established there as an independent ministry. And he was the director of this project for many years. And so he took me there and he taught me how to inject uh, people. Um, he taught me, he actually allowed me and directed me to actually um, have a delivery, and help a woman have a delivery. And I was able to do the whole process. It was guiding me and I even cut the whole thing. It was amazing. <laughs> you see, every time a patient would come in, would come in with this face of struggle, of pain, of hurt. And when they left that clinic after my dad would see them and prayed for them, their change was evident. They were not the same person. And for the first time in my life, I realized my dad was the most successful man in the world. And he had nothing to do with money. He had nothing to do with power. He had nothing to do with fame because we didn't have none of those. And yet to me, he was the most successful man in the world. A couple of chapters after Jesus' profound sermon on the mountain, we found a young man 
that is also confronted with a similar situation, a similar calling? Are we going to be successful according to this world or are we going to be successful according to God's kingdom? That was basically the situation that was put before him. Let's go to Matthew chapter 19. And we're going to read this story, 19, 16 to 22. Matthew chapter 19, verse 16 through 22. Can I hear an amen when you have it? Amen. All right. It reads, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I might have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, Keep the commandments. The goal. This young man had the right goal. He came before Jesus with the right question, with the right intention. He wanted to know how he could have eternal life. That's a wonderful goal. That's a wonderful objective that he had. And he came before Jesus looking for the answer. And Jesus answered him, do my will. Do God's will. The story continues, verse 21. Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, because he already said, he answered, well, I've done that my whole life. I kept the Ten Commandments. Jesus answers in verse 21. Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Verse 22, but when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. This young man had the right goal. Uh, he came to the right place. Uh, he asked the right question. He had the right vision. He wanted, he desired an identity with God. He desired to have eternity, to have that connection with God. That was perfect but there was a problem you see he had also worldly goals he also wanted to keep that earthly identity he wanted to be known as a rich man he wanted to be known as famous he wanted that fame he wanted that popularity he wanted that influence and he, and he knew that if he would have lost his money probably all of that would have gone apart what about ourselves? Perhaps we have the same problem. We have worldly goals and still wish to keep the heavenly principles. And sometimes Satan knows that's the battle that there is. And he tries to take away our identity by providing opportunities for us to sell out our principles. Look, there's a good job. It's a great opportunity. But you know, you just have to work Saturdays for, you know, just give that up. It's okay. God will understand. Just give up your identity and just, you know, redefine yourself according to this world. So, how can we be successful according to change your vision? With the vision. It's a matter, it's a matter of vision. It's a matter, it's a matter of redemption. It's a matter of redemption. We have to have goals that are connected with our vision. We have to look beyond this earth. Those goals are the ones that we should be taking a whole time, a whole effort, a whole uh, whatever we have. That's what we put our effort into to reach those goals that are aligned with our vision of heaven and eternity with Christ. Number three, surrender your will. Tell a person sitting next to you, surrender your will. Surrender your will. It's no longer a matter of what I want, what I desire. It's a matter of what God wants and what He desires for my life. Once we fulfill these three things, we are successful according to God's kingdom. So number one, 
change your vision. Number two, align your goals with the vision. Number three, surrender your will. Perfect. You see, this is what Jesus explains after he, he reveals our identity. He goes on and explains in the, the next verses of Matthew chapter 5, 17 through 19. It's all about doing the will of God. That's where true success for a Christian is. Um, it reads 17, and you can read it with me. Do you have it? Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 19. Can I hear an amen? amen? Amen. It says, Do not think that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to what? Fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one little will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever goes and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of God. True success, true success of a Christian is to do God's will. To be the light of this world is to do the will of God. To be made into the image and likeness of God means to fulfill His will. What is the will of God for my life, Pastor? That's great. But what is it for me? In my circumstance? What should I do? What is God telling me to do? There's many perspectives about the will of God. Many, many view the will of God as a lottery ticket. You know, you got to be the lucky one to have it. It doesn't come to everybody. It's just lucky few, you know. Just few men throughout history. God reveals himself and tells them what to do and where to go. So you got to be very lucky for God to reveal you that. Lottery ticket perspective. Others view it as a dot game. You know, this game where you have to follow all the little steps and all the little clues in order for you to find. And, and if, the, the, if you see a bird, that means something. And if you, um, somebody tells you or, or somebody is dressed a certain way or the first person who smiles at you, it means something. So you have to, you can't miss the clues because if you miss the clues, you miss the will of God for your life. A dot game. A game of clues. Trying to figure out what God is trying to tell me. If you really want to know what is the will of God for your life, you have to go to the only reliable source of the will of God. And it's right here. This is the only reliable source. Not the pastor, not the elder. I'm sorry. I'm not from this church, so I can't speak against it. I'm leaving tomorrow. I'm sorry to break it to you. It's not, the, it's not me. It's not me. It's the Bible. It's the Word of God, the living Word of God, the one who's going to reveal to you directly, personally, where to go, what to do. Through this, um, we have been corrupted and de degenerated by ages of sin. Nevertheless, God has not lost hope in our salvation. He wants us uh, to reclaim our originality and be according to his image and likeness by fulfilling his will in our life. If we are capable of understanding these words of Jesus, we would have experienced the factory reset of our creator. I would like to conclude with a, with a story. You see, it's one thing to, to see what a man of success is and to acknowledge it. And totally different thing is to actually apply it into your life. And so it happened to me. I was in Cuba. I was doing my seminar um, study. And then I was invited to come to New York to do uh, canvassing work. Any canvassers here? Can I see some hands? Oh, there, I see one there. 
wonderful ministry, amazing ministry. And so um, I was invited there, and I remember I was, you know, in the plane, and I was looking down at that beautiful city of New York. I looked down, and if you could see my face then, (laughs) I had the dollar signs in my eyes. (laughs) I said, oh, man, I'm going to make it here. I'm going to sell so many books. I'm going to be rich by the time I'm done. I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to have extra money. I'm going to pay my school, and I have extra money. Oh, I'm going to be so rich. I'm going to make so much money. That's, that's what came to my mind. That's, that was my perspective of success. And so that first day came. I had no training. Uh, but still, you know, I had that desire to be successful, to find that hidden treasure of money that was waiting just for me. And so I was assigned to Manhattan, out of all places. Um, and I... I remember I carried as many books as I could because that day I was going to sell so many books. And so I carried my bag, took the train, went to Manhattan, and I was just overwhelmed by all the big buildings. And I tried to enter some of those those buildings, but the security wouldn't let me. (laughs) So naive. I tried other buildings. They wouldn't let me. So I started doing it, trying to sell books in the street. Everybody was too busy, too busy. And so another idea came, I, I, I'm going to do it, um, you know, in the train station. I'm going to get in the, in the train and try to sell some books, make that money. Didn't work. Didn't work. Uh, some people would give me a dollar. I went by with that. I could, I could buy some snacks. And I went by, and a day came and went, and there was a week. I was just living out of little tips, little offerings that they would give me. No books sold. And I should have read The Cold Porter, the book by Ellen G. White from the beginning. I didn't. <laughs> Until I was doing the job, that's when I started reading it. And in there, she gives us the vision of what truly is. Um, the cold porting ministry. And it is a beautiful and amazing ministry. And it gives us this perspective of how we are agents who's, who are sowing the seeds of people. And that we shouldn't um, take away any opportunity that we have to share the gospel and use the literature that we have to share that. And in there, she says, and we shouldn't sell a book without praying for that person. She encourages us to pray. And I took that to heart and said, okay, so I'm going to sell books, but also I'm going to fulfill this other part I haven't been doing. I'm going to pray for people. And so this time I shifted my strategy and I went to Walmart. I went to Costco and all these things, all these places. And and while people were coming out, I would approach them. I'll do my one minute presentation, try to go as fast as I could. Oh, no, thank you. Can I pray for you? And to my surprise, they said, yes. Yes, you can pray for me. And in the parking lot, I would pray for people. It was amazing. I felt how God was using me. And I did it one and twice. And I did it again, 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 again. No book sold, but a lot of prayers. One day, I, I, I looked And there was a beautiful Mercedes-Benz car. And I thought, man, again, my perspective, wrong perspective. There's money right there. I'm going to go sell some books. Did my presentation. It was a young man. He said, no, thank you. But I remember the mission. Can I pray for you? He was surprised. He said, yes, 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 of course. I prayed for him. And he said, now I want to pray for you. Nobody had ever offered that. But I want to do it in Arabic, if that's okay. I'm a Muslim. And I said, I was surprised. Yes, please. And so he began doing his prayer in Arabic. In the middle of the parking lot, blessing me in Arabic. That summer... I was the least person who sold books. Did terrible. (laughs) 
But you see, my perspective of success changed. To all my other peers, I was not successful. But in my heart, I knew that according to God, I was the most successful. Because you see, I prayed for so many people, heard so many stories, had so many amazing experiences. I knew God had used me that summer. I had no money. I had no power. I had no fame. But I was successful. Till this day, I have no money. I have no power. I'm not famous. But I am successful. According to God. According to His kingdom. It's a life of commitment. It's the desire to do God's will. My father died three years ago. Serving his community. In the midst of COVID, he served people who were dying And he contracted COVID. We told him, Dad, don't, don't do that. Come on, you got to take care of yourself. But he knew that God was calling him to serve others. To serve his community, to serve his purpose. To obey God. And so he saved as many people as he could despite the fact that he knew he was at risk of losing his own. So one day he contracted COVID, called me in the middle of the night. Right before he got worse, he said, Rudy, I want you to pray for my soul. What are you talking about, Dad? I was in Taiwan uh, in a mission uh, as a chaplain there, following his example of doing God's will, just following God wherever he leads you, wherever he opens the door, just share the gospel, just share the good news, be the light in the world. Following that example he had given me, passionate for mission. He said, pray for me, pray for my soul. I know I'm going to get worse. I prayed for him, but I didn't believe. Um, two weeks passed. I was able to travel back to Nicaragua. And just three hours away from actually meeting him, he passed away. I wasn't able to say goodbye. When I got to Nicaragua, um, I was taken to the hospital, and I was the one who recognized his face. Um, hard moment for our family, for us. But... During his life, many people got to know Jesus and gave their life for him. But even after his death, the whole community was impacted. There were so many people who gave their life for Jesus because they knew that that doctor right there, he served his community. He was a man of God who followed God's will despite his own benefits, despite his own desires. That's the legacy he left in my family. And that's the example I tried to follow, a man who practiced what he preached. Follow me, says Jesus. Wherever that may be, whatever sacrifice we must do, follow me. And when we follow Jesus, we are the light of this world. When we follow Jesus, we are the salt. We're not just here to make a difference. We are the difference. So the call for this morning is, are we ex gonna accept God's will in my life despite that may bring? As long as we're certain that we're following Jesus, our salvation is guaranteed. I know I'm gonna see my father. I know this is not the end between us. I'm so happy and so glad to tell him all the consequences, all the things that happened after his life and his passing. I'm so excited for that. 
and I'm committed to follow Jesus. For whatever sacrifice I have made and I will make, it will be nothing. Because I know that eternity is guaranteed if I follow Jesus. So I want to ask you this morning, do you want to accept the call of Jesus? He's calling you to be the light. He's calling you to be salt. He is calling you to fulfill his will in your life. If you'd like to accept this morning, I would like you to stand. And by faith, I want to do a special prayer. Um, it's a public commitment. It's, I would like to call on you to take those steps of faith. We're going to call it that way. If you want to come to the altar and take those first steps, we don't know what the future holds, but still, you want to fulfill God's will, you want to follow Jesus, wherever that way leads you, you want to take the first steps with Jesus and reclaim your identity in Christ, I'd like to invite you to come over. I want to pray for you and that beautiful journey that God has prepared for you. I want to pray for you. I want God to take your life as it is, as broken, as hurt as you are, it's okay. You can come to Jesus. If you're committed to do his will, that's okay. However you are. God is not asking you to be perfect before he takes you. No. It's a process. We've learned of that process during these few nights. Evaporation. God promises to evaporate all our iniquities, all our sins. He takes away all of that for us to remain salt and pure. There's another process. God promises pulverization. He promises to refine us, take away all the character, uh, the bad character that we have. He promises to take that away and for us to remain pure salt, refine us. And today we acknowledge that God is calling us to be the light, to follow his example. Jesus said, I've come here and I do my Father's will. He did the will of the Father to give us example to also do the will of God. Jesus did the will of his Father and he led him to the cross. The most beautiful thing in human history. It takes a couple of sacrifices. But I'm going to pray for God to take your life and lead you, reveal that path that you may take. Let us pray. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you for your patience. Those who are standing, those who are here in the altar, Lord, we're committing ourselves, we're committing our lives to you. Some of us are afraid, some of us are scared. We don't know what the future holds. All we know is that this morning, we want to give our hearts to you. Whatever we have, whatever we are, we give it to you. For you to take it, Lord, for you to evaporate all our sins, erase them, for you to refine our lives, and for you to lead us. Lead us. We want to follow you. We want to do your will in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Testing. Gracias. Let us sing together. This has been the, the theme song. Who you say I am and thank you pastor for sharing I invite you to stand with us as we say who you say I am I'll come down come 
and sing who I am. Who am I? Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Jesus died for me, yes, he died for me, the sun, the sun sets free, oh, it's free I'm a child of God, yes, I I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. Thank you so much again for being with us. We don't want to leave this place without you. So go before us. And Father, as the youth and young adults, as we continue to worship you this afternoon, let us continue to glorify your name. You are a great Father. And in you we find our identity. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. And God bless you. <laughs> 